This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Thank you for joining us today on this edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney. Today on the download, we have quite the wild ride on U.S. stock markets on Monday, the Dow losing over 800 points, seeing its worst day since October of last year. The main driving factor behind this being Chinese, the second largest Chinese real estate development firm, Evergrande, missing its first round of over $100 million in debt payments on what is underlying several billion dollars worth of debt now starts the clock on 30 days to see if they can come up and cure this missed payment. Otherwise, they will be in default and the creditors can start coming for the assets of the company. However, it is widely believed that the uh, Chinese government will step in as they have in the past with other companies that have been in financial trouble to bail out this development company. However, the woes of Evergrande's mispayment trickled through markets across the world, starting with Hong Kong on Monday and ending with the Dow showing its worst day since the third quarter of or the fourth quarter of last year. Now, this kind of ripple effect and huge market correction does certainly illustrate the need for people to have a higher degree of diversity in their retirement plans. And with some current legislation coming out in the over $3 trillion infrastructure and reconciliation bill, it is going to even further highlight the need for being involved in the legislative process. Now, we're going to have a special edition Alternative Investing Advantage podcast on some of these legislative issues that are going to affect IRA investors next week. So make sure you turn into that. And another external market factor that is extremely important for people to understand the interest rates that are being seen on long term debt for real estate are also projected to go up due to the Fed stopping the stimulus purchase program that they had started last June, where they were buying $80 billion in treasury and $40 billion in mortgage-backed securities each month. This has been The Download. Today on The What Is... The solo 401k. Now, anyone that has been employed in the US is probably familiar with the solo 401k. However, those of you that are self employed or maybe run an owner operated business with you and a spouse or just one other business partner might be looking at establishing some type of retirement plan for that business. Now, a lot of people aren't aware that the larger 401ks can be reduced down and utilized for the self-employed or owner-operated business. Now, these plans can offer a great degree of flexibility for those looking to save more for retirement that don't have a traditional nine-to-five job. These plans allow you to contribute up to $19,500 of your take-home pay of that business to the plan as either a deductible or non-deductible contribution. So a really cool part is that you get to make Roth or traditional contributions to this plan. You don't have to pick one or the other and you can change from year to year. You also, when you are 50 and a half, get an additional $6,000 bump to your contribution limits, bring it up to $25,500. And then the portion that a lot of people think they're going to miss out on is the employer match, that awesome kind of free money that you get from a more traditional 401k if your employer agrees to match it. Well, with the self-employed individual or the owner-operated business using a solo 401k, you do get to take advantage of that and create a large corporate deduction for your business. Or if you're filing as a pass-through, potentially getting to take that as a personal deduction, depending on how you file your taxes. But you get to contribute up to 25% of your net operating income, not to exceed $37,500 per year to the plan as well. Now, all of these things combined make for one extremely powerful tool for the self-employed individual to utilize for their retirement savings. This has been The What Is. OK, 
Okay, today on our guest section of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast, we have Adrian Smood, a local real estate investor in the Tampa Bay area who specializes in mobile homes in the Polk County and Lakeland area. I wanted to have him on to uh, kind of get a a deeper dive into a segment of uh, increasing popularity, uh, at least with our client base and as well as the uh, real estate market in general. So Adrian, thank you very much for being on with us today. Alex, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So as with any of my guests, I always like to get a little bit of a background. So, uh, you know, kind of give us the, uh, uh, you know, the short and skinny of, you know, what, what brought you here, you know, uh, you know, where'd you grow up, uh, kind of what got you uh, started in real estate investing. I know I've heard the story a few times, but it's always good to, uh, to hear for new people. So kind of give us the lowdown on that. The quick story is I am a Florida native. I'm a rare breed down here. And I started as my real estate investing career as a tenant. I was evicted. I was a terrible tenant. Then I had a family member that was a mortgage broker. He said, why don't you buy a place? Now, this was about 19 years ago. So all you had to do was sign the piece of paper and the mortgage company gave you the keys to a house. I moved in there with my friends that helped me get evicted. I dabbled a little bit with what the banks had taught me. And fast forward, probably about 10 years, I started going to RIA's. And at the re is when I learned about what I call the real side of real estate investing. We're using private money and becoming a little more creative. And that's where I learned about mobile homes. I talked to the seasoned guy and girl in the back of the room, you know, the one that didn't need to do another deal. They're just there because they love real estate. And they all talked about mobile homes at some point. And that's yeah. how we got that niche. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of the kind of common threads that I've also seen in my career is, um, you know, some of the, the, the people that have made the most money or seem to be at least the most successful of the metric of, you know, buying the most properties or having, you know, the most going on typically always have one thing in common and that is, is mobile homes in some form or fashion, you know, none of them completely, you know, maybe have that as their four core focus of their portfolio, but it's always a, a factor of it. Um, you know, I've seen that in my personal and professional life. So maybe tell us about, uh, you know, you, you started going to Rias. Tell us about the first deal. What was the uh, the first one that got your feet wet? And uh, was it a success? Did it kind of scare you? Or, uh, you know, was it kind of one of those things where once you, uh, you know, wet your beak, yeah, you just couldn't get enough? Well, I was definitely scared on my first one because I really didn't know much about mobile homes. And in Florida, they're called hurricane missiles, if you don't know anything. About them and they're scary you know that's the mindset I was brought up in but the cash flow is what it attracted me and really I had a friend that was working with some a realtor so really she brought it to me as a bird dog because the realtor needed this property gone because he was selling the couple that owned it a new house so he was making a big commission on that one and they had a small mortgage that needed to be disappeared on the mobile home in order for them to qualify for him to make the big check. And he didn't even want to deal with the commission. This was a $16,000, 1963. And it came with the land. So it was 0 0.09 acres. It w went against what most people will tell you not to buy. You had a bedroom, you had to walk through one bedroom to get to another. The septic is a little bit of a weird spot that I might have problems one day, but I saw the cash flow, I saw the numbers, and I just wanted to get started. And I pulled the trigger. And I'll say within a month, I bought a second one. <laughs> so I saw the cash flow, I saw it working. Another investor gave me an opportunity, and I bought three within two months when I first started out in the mobile home side. Nice. How, how did you uh, how'd you finance these? Were you just buying cash? Were you getting owner financing, bank financing? I know this was quite a while ago, so maybe the financing side of things has changed, but uh, tell us a little bit about how you managed to acquire those. Where'd the money come from? So these first ones were all older, meaning older than like 1980. Oh, the banks definitely weren't going to touch them. Sure. I bought the first one with cash, spent most of the rest of our savings. I kind of had heard <laughs> a speaker once talk about you either need to succeed real quick or hit this like splat point, don't slowly fail. So my theory was I'm either going to lose all of our savings and hit that splat point that the speaker talked about, which well, maybe it would have worked, maybe it wouldn't have. Luckily, it succeeded for me, and I didn't have to hit that, that rock bottom splat point. The second one, yeah, I was out of money. As uh, Pete Fortunato says, I was $15,000 short because the purchase price was 
15,500 on the second one I bought. <laughs> but I went to a self-directed IRA. Really, I had a friend. He had a self-directed IRA he had done nothing with. So he had all the money sitting there for the years, you know, not making money with it because he really didn't know what he was going to do. And we hooked up and he lent me the money. He's been getting a good rate of return. I got to buy the property with very little of my money in it. So it's worked out really well. That's been our main source of financing. You know, we still have bought some more properties with cash. And the third one is owner financing. When it comes to these older ones, like I said, the banks aren't going to finance them. So you need either the owner to let you make payments, your own cash or, or friends with money. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's I think most people would all kind of agree that, you know, it's it's easy enough to, you know, people are probably familiar with, you know, going to a bank and getting financing. Um, you know, whether or not to do that on a, on a mobile home is probably leaning more towards no or, you know, a friend with some money. You know, that's kind of easy enough to peg down. But when it comes to owner financing, you know, this is something that I know both you and I have you know had a lot of experience in, um, but at least maybe for people tuning in. What are some kind of maybe some key tips if, you know, besides just, you know, looking up the title and saying, hey, you know, Jane Smith holds a title to this, you know, let me let me give her a call and see if she'll finance it. Is it that simple? Are there, are there some things that go into it past that? Uh, you know, I think that'd be something some people might be a little bit more interested to, uh, to learn a bit, a bit more about. I always give people multiple offers before I even give them the offers out. I talk to them. I want to sit down and talk to them so we can figure out what they truly need. And then I can work out some options for them that also benefit me. Typically, I will offer someone exactly what they're asking for if they will give me the ability to make them payments. And the payments, I always get the question, well, how long, how do you figure out how long? Well, that's the number I solve for. I start out with a number that works for me as a monthly payment. And we have how much they're asking for. Then we'll subtract whatever deposit I put down or not the pause, uh, the down payment. Sure. That's where I was for, uh, which is usually about the same as the deposit and interest rate. I don't like to talk about that. And if they bring it up, then we go with whatever number that we can negotiate. I'll tell you in this market, a lot of people, they'll tell me they're happy with two, 3%. And I'm happy with that as well, because as an investor, as most people know, we don't get those rates very sure. often. Yeah. And even, I mean, in most cases, I mean, for the investor, I mean, if you're, if you're managing to do some stuff, you know, below 10%, you know, a lot of people would consider that kind of coming out ahead. So if you can, you know, if you're pegging these things down for, you know, three to five, I mean, you're still, you know, knocking it right out of the park with that. Now it, more often, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say it's benefiting the seller as well, because a lot of the people we've dealt with, they're going to put the money in the bank and just let it sit there. So they're making more than the bank would pay them. Yeah, on my uh, on my cash account, I think Chase Bank gave me uh, about twelve cents last month. I was I was really happy. <laughs> you know, I think about another ten months, I can go buy a pack of gum. I'll be elated. My wife will be just you know so happy. I'll be I'll be I'll be, I'll be in high cotton then. Um, but uh, maybe one thing I always kind of hear a lot about, and I've heard you know different things from different people. I mean, you talk to Bill Cook, Pete Fortunato. Uh, you know, any of, you know, Dyke Spotify, you'll hear different people say different things, but when you sit down, is it, do you, do you find a common thread with people that own or sell mobile homes? Um, when you sit down to try to get that owner financing, you say, Hey, you know, what, what do you want? You're trying to figure out, you know, what they're looking for. Is there a common thread that these people are looking for? Or they're just looking saying, Hey, I'm tired of being a landlord. Or I just want cash. Uh, do I want to create cash flow so I can reduce my, you know, potential taxes I'm going to pay? Is there something that people say, or is it kind of something that's new each time when you when you sit down and talk to someone to finance one of these? If it is an investor that's selling it to us, they do think about the tax burden of selling it for cash. Uh, that's a quick topic that comes up, and if I can make them payments, then they can make their payment their taxes over the time that I they get their payments from me. But I would say with the homeowners that live in the home and they're selling us it, a lot of times they do get kind of stuck on price. And if I'm willing to give them exactly their price that they want, they do like me better. And I found in the mobile home world, it's not a brand new topic for the owner to finance it to. Because a lot of the people bought it on owner financing. So mm -hmm. in single family world, you know, it's sometimes a brand new topic. Why don't you go to a bank? I've never heard of this. The mobile homeowners, a lot of them have heard of it before because that's how they bought it. 
Sure. Yeah. And because uh, another big thing, at least in a lot of states and, and, and educate me here, I don't I'm not sure if this holds true, but I had a lot of experience when I was kind of starting out here at Advanta. Um, if anyone's heard our, our previous episodes of the alternative investing advantage, I, I did investments for clients and, and had a lot of experience processing this. But uh, there's a thing called, uh, you know, mobile homes are more often than not considered like titled as similar as cars. Um, so people can do things that fall under like the auspice and the laws of, of like lending on car notes and people would do re- retail installment contracts, which are, uh, you know, kind of a little bit outside the regulations of traditional mortgages. So, uh, you know, owners would typically finance these like vehicles, you know, if you lived in one and you could, you know, get a long form from the DMV and just sell it on a, on a retail installment contract or you know, kind of a rent to own or basically the same thing as making a car payment. Uh, does that kind of same thing hold true in the state of Florida? Or is it a little bit more regulated? I know in the state of Georgia, that was extremely popular with my real with my uh, mobile home investing clients was the retail installment contract. I've seen that to be pretty true. It does fall under the Dodd Frank now. You know, we're waiting for really? there to maybe one day be an actual court case so we can find out what the real ruling is of Dodd Frank. But everything I understand, it does fall under Dodd Frank if you own the land or if you own just the home. So you okay. wouldn't need to comply with that. You know, mm-hmm. most of what we do is we do the home and land together. So in that manner, I know it falls under Dodd Frank. And yeah, but there's a lot of the however you want to call it, rent to own, yeah. land contract. Everyone has a different term that they're familiar with. But we haven't seen it to be much of a problem here. I mainly let the title company deal with it. You know, yeah. a lot of people want to do it at the park bench or McDonald's or whatever, and they don't want to go through a title company. I always tell the sellers, look, we're going to deal with the title company. They're the professionals. I'm going to pay them to take care of it, make sure you're protected and I'm protected. And that's exactly what I do. Sure. Absolutely. Now with these kind of things that you're finding, you know, you keep mentioning, you know, owning them with land. That's, you know, most of the time, at least when people maybe see one of these pop up on Facebook marketplace, they'll see, you know, lot rent indicating that the the home is in a, in a, in a mobile home park, uh, which is typically something you stay away from more often than not, just because one, you have, you know, the vig of paying, you know, someone, you know, an additional 300 months a year cash flow, which is, you know, I don't think many investors would see that as a good thing of just having to pay someone else for the right to, you know, own and use their property. Um, but I've been seeing a lot of those things kind of get the parks get snatched up by, uh, you know, larger uh, investment firms like, you know, Blackstone Capital and, and different places. Uh, now, you primarily like to stay away from those um, and invest in mobile homes with land. Am I correct? Um, or is there is there a time and a place for investing in parks or is it just one of those things where, you know, you kind of just let the bigger fish have it and you focus on, you know, the other parts of the market because there's enough meat there to, to, eat, to eat. You kind of hit it there. We have focused right in the middle with just the home and land because the parks became these big sexy things and everyone's attracted there. And then the only the home, uh, some of us call them the Lonnie deals because Lonnie Scruggs back in the days is the one that made it popular. Those are, we'll say the cheapos, you get in those a little bit less because you're not buying any dirt. And there's just like this forgotten spot in the middle. And that's one reason we made that our business. It's good cash flow, but there's less competition in it and we're still buying dirt. Now we have looked at parks and I'm actually looking at one right now. I'm very picky because yeah. there's a lot of more that goes into a park. And, you know, there's actually, there's more work in a park, I believe, than owning just a little single unit with the, the dirt the ones in the parks though i think those are a great way to start and i mean you mentioned bill cook i'm pretty sure that's how he bought his one of his parks yeah he had just the home in the park he was paying the monthly lot rent every month he was building that rapport with the park owner so that one day he could go to him and say i'd love to buy a park like this one day and he was the guy yeah i love that idea that's one of our reasons for looking at those little deals inside the parks again, because we can be the first one to buy the park. Yeah. Death, death by a thousand cuts on, the, yeah. on that. But that's a, that's a great point. I never, I, I don't think I ever heard that story uh, from him, but that's, I mean, that's a great point, you know, just get in there, you know, get your foot in the door and keep doing it. And then hopefully they're a, they're a tired park owner. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to investing in a park, I mean, geez, you have, I mean, you got to maintain roads you have. I mean, if there's a, a community center and a pool and all the other stuff that, you know, you don't think of with a, you know, just buying, you know, a mobile home with on, on some 
you know, quarter acre with a, with a septic system. Now you got, you know, if, if you got 10 different septics or if it's hooked up yeah. to city and all sorts of different it, stuff, but you know, I guess, you know, you got, you got a, got a good investment opportunity there. Otherwise the big guys wouldn't be going after them. So, uh, but I can just imagine the headaches for, for days with that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you have a well, it has to get tested every month to make sure that the water, because you're now supplying water, you're out of a water supply. And you have to do that every single month. And the one that we are looking at has that, and it has eight septics for 12 units, meaning some of the units are sharing septics. Oh, wow. And there's a lot that goes into it, like you said, and it's not as easy and quick. And because you have multiple units there, you're dealing with the municipality a little bit more than you do with just a single unit. Yeah, exactly. Now, was I mean not to obviously get too specific. Was this this is a, a park in Florida somewhere? Yep. Okay. A wholesaler brought it to me, but did make it a little more difficult to sit down with the owner because the yeah. owner is owner financing. I've been having to go through all the emails and I'm like, can we just get close enough and all sit down together? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, I I can understand why wholesalers are a little bit cagey about that, but the. I mean, the thing is, you know, for, for any seasoned investor, it's like, you know, who really cares what the other people in the deal are making? If you're making what you need to make, I mean, if some guy's making a million bucks on the deal and I was happy with making 20,000 on it, I, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think most most of the more seasoned people, but I mean, people do get upset about that when they see, you know, the stuff come together at closing um, and then they're just hoping people don't walk away. But uh, you know, hopefully it works <laughs> out for you. That's, I mean, you know, getting a park, I know that would be a you know, at least from knowing you over the years, that'd be a, a really cool thing to see see happen in, in your career. I, you know, <laughs> I want to touch on real quick, Alex, the part you just said of a lot of people don't want to pay that. I want to pay as much as possible because I'm only going to buy on my numbers regardless of anything yeah. else. But if I paid you $10,000 wholesale fee and everyone else only wants to pay you five, you're probably going to come to me before everyone else with your next deal. Sure. But I look at it as if I can pay people for bringing me deals, I can get more deals. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you're the guy that pays more yeah. than anyone else, I mean, I think one of the things that I see getting lost in the fact that real estate has, you know, is, has been, I mean, it's, let's be honest, it's been popular for, you know, as long as there's been people buying land, but since there's been such a kind of a exponential uptick in, in prices and everything, people have you know, a lot more people that haven't had maybe as much experience get into it. And then they're a little bit more concerned with that. You know, it's, you know, if everyone can, you know, make money, you know, you don't need to make all the money yourself. If you can help someone else make, you know, instead, if you make, you know, 10 grand on a deal instead of 15 and the other person gets to get their foot in the door, you know, they're going to bring you, you know, mm -hmm. more deals than that. You know, you're the first person on their mind if they made an extra five with you, as opposed to the other person. Granted, you lost out on that five, but you get another five deals down the road. Um, and I'd love to see, you know, more people realize that because the more people we have doing well, you know, the rising tide raises all ships in this scenario. So now, totally agree. you know, you only deal in the state of Florida. And if I'm correct, you pretty much stay within like a, a one hour circle of, of Lakeland, more or less, correct? more like a 30 minute circle <laughs> uh, diamond at that of, oh, uh, plant nice. so we, we say a very tight area yeah now is there do you feel like the the market in general for mobile homes is kind of uh you know specific to is in, like something you could like expand everywhere is you do you have you seen things from other places that uh you know might be a little bit different from florida or something that florida has i mean Florida has a many a multitude of things that are unique to our lovely state. Um, you know, is there anything specific to Florida with the mobile home investing that might be different from other places? I mean, I know there's a lot here, but I love to travel and I travel a lot and I see mobile homes everywhere, mm -hmm. all over the place. I know that they've been in Alaska since the fifties. Yeah. So they can keep them in Alaska and keep them warm. I still don't understand how that happens. But if they're up in Alaska since the 50s, they're all over the country. If you start looking a little bit more for them, you're going to notice what's a mobile home and what's not. And I guarantee that they've been along everyone's drive around their town. They just might not be you know, in the downtown areas, but usually in the rural areas, they're all over. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, 
I, we're in Pinellas County. I've lived in Pinellas County for a long time, super high population density. Uh, so you don't see as many there were normally in parks, but you get out and, you know, start seeing green space in almost any state. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I grew up in North Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and everything. I mean, the second you get outside of, you know, a, a city, I mean, you see them everywhere. So with, with people, you know, it kind of brings up my next point is that, you know, people say it's hard to find deals. You know, how would you recommend, you know, people going out and finding them, you know, it's, you know, you got your start with a RIA. Uh, you know, I, I recommend personally finding a good RIA. You know, we have a great RIA in Polk County. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the good RIAs. There's, there's tons of them out there. It's just like, you know, everyone needs to eat food, but I recommend you eat good food. Uh, so I, I'm a huge fan of, of, you know, the quality ones, you know, places like, you know, Sarasota RIA, uh, and, and Polk County Rear are kind of the two of, of my favorites that I attend. There's other great ones in the area, but, you know, finding a good RIA, you know, past that, how, what, how do you recommend people kind of get, dip their, dip their foot in this? I mean, you can do all the exact same marketing as you would do for a site built home, meaning, uh, the bandit signs, letters, online, Google, any of that. The big trick is you replace the word house with mobile homes and, that's really what you do. We have done that. It's worked out well, but most of our deals have come from other investors. So that's mainly Rias. I stand up and say, I love mobile homes. People look at me weird. They tell me, aren't those terrible and they're bad investments. I joke around and say, you're right. Send me all your deals. <laughs> I will take all of them. It's like, they are horrible. And, and you know what? You don't want them. So give them to me. I'll tell you. That's exa- I joke around with that. You know, I, I'll always help anyone, but most people don't want to deal with them. And we focus on cash flow, so we love them. The other way that we've done really well is realtors. Realtors are pretty similar. They're gonna do the about the same amount of paperwork for a twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollar mobile as they're gonna do for a hundred fifty, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar house, and they get a bigger check on the house. And a lot of realtors also don't understand mobile homes. So I go to networking events for realtors, uh, continue education for realtors. For one, I get to learn a little bit but I get to be the different guy in the room that's not a realtor. And I am there to help them when they have a lead for a mobile home and they just want to help the person out. I tell them, give me a call and I'll help out however I can. Sometimes I'm able to buy it. Sometimes I just help them with information. So being an information source and just there to help people needs come. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a great point they make. And uh, you know, to kind of further that education, there's a, you know, there's, there's a multitude of different places. You mentioned uh, Lonnie Scruggs. Did he write a book regarding this? Yep. Deals on wheels. Deals on wheels. Yeah. I think it's for sale on Amazon, like a hundred dollars, or you can Google it and probably get the PDF for free. So. Not, that, not that I would recommend you ever uh, infringe on intellectual property, but uh, Lonnie Scruggs, uh, you know, deals on wheels is a good one. And then uh, I understand you have a, a class coming up as well. I'd like to give you the opportunity to plug that coming up in October, correct? Yes, sir. I appreciate it. It's October 9th. It's going to be an all day in person in Lakeland. It's also going to be on Zoom. It's going to be half by me, which is the rental side and more with the older mobile homes. And I'm bringing in my friend, Mark Bracey, because he does the fix and flip side. He's done over 100 fix and flips in mobile homes, and that's his area of expertise. So he's going to talk about what he does. And he's in, out of Jacksonville. But he's local to Florida as well. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, you know, it kind of gets up on, on the end of our time for our interview segment. Uh, you know, great information. Hopefully, you know, gets people interested in the topic. Uh, you know, we've had Adrian on on our uh, webinar series before a few times for a little bit longer deep dive into, you know, kind of identifying mobile homes, you know, what part you got to crawl under to find VIN numbers on frames and, uh, you know, how how titling works and which closet to look into for, for uh, you know, different information and stuff like that. So if you uh, have any uh, things like that that you'd like to uh, get a little more information on, uh, you know, we'd really recommend that you uh, sign up for his class if you're local. If not, um, you know, the webinar would be great. Uh, I don't know if you want to put some contact information out there for anyone listening that wants to get in touch with you regarding questions they might have or classes that you have coming up, but uh, you can also put that out there if you'd like. The best way to get a hold of me is adriansmood.com, A-D-R-I-A-N-S-M-U-D-E. Dot com and that'll have a link there for education, social medias, everything's right there. 
All right, great. Well, uh, I really appreciate you uh, being on with us today uh, on this episode of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Hope some people got some good information with our great guest, Adrian. With that said, I'll let you get back to your day. And uh, again, thanks for being on. Thanks, Alex. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.